I am finding a foot under my bed, finding blood in the sink. But this time, someone is with me. My friend Elle stays on the phone. This is what she did. She made space for me to speak, and I discharged bits and pieces of language rapidly, at first with no interruption, words stumbling, repeating like the verbal panic of someone who has just left the scene of an accident. And she held the words, sometimes echoing back what I had expressed or asking a question, sometimes elaborating on one of my statements. She was not explaining or interpreting them, but opening a word tenderly, the way you would detangle a knot while brushing a daughter's hair. We were thousands of miles apart, but on the phone, it was as if a mirror held us together in its silver dimension. She did not reciprocate with a story of her own, not in those hours. She gently grasped what I said. If I used a confusing image, she offered a glimpse into what it might mean to her. She provided a nearing, a nodding. Unlike the nurses or the psychiatrist who could make no sense of my descriptions, she knew Hastings Street, the lumps of clothes found or stolen and available for resale for the next $20 hit, the pink optimism of the neon pig above the meat store, the glass condos reaching like monsters to push people away from the concrete where they slept. I was talking about the women who walked this street and crosses, white crosses, no crosses, anywhere on the street, just graffiti, ragged, red, witnessing, and warnings. In the pomegranate juice lining my fridge, I could see blood. In the tangle of a t-shirt, I could see the whiteness of white crosses. My friend Elle is an indigenous woman who was not going to say anything chipper to me about getting the railroad. And her ethical and compassionate insight, even in my vulnerable state, I knew it, could feel it, could finally lean my frightened mind toward a soul who heard not gibberish, but testimony. Suffering broke forth words, and words broke forth suffering. She did not dismiss the violence or the negation of it. She did not pathologize my need to tell and retell. On this occasion, she refrained from offering the perspective of a wider political frame, but stayed with each detail I offered. She remained intricately attuned to each possible nuance of my meanings, the ones that led to historical facts and the ones that led away from them. Her voice calm, her words braced a reality of violence that was a reality, even if not in that moment, present in my apartment. I spoke of bodies and we spoke too of my body, its living need for breath, food, sleep. Since she could not see me, she often asked where I was or what I was doing. And I sensed that this effort of spatial orientation was for my benefit, as much as it was for hers, bringing me back into a physical world through the effort to narrate something sturdy in words I could trust. We stayed on the phone, off and on, for two days. In Catch Them Before They Fall, the psychoanalyst Christopher Bolas describes a renegade move. If he apprehends that one of his clients is nearing breakdown, he extends the time of his sessions. Vulnerability to breakdown is exhibited in the pattern and speed of speech, an inability for a client to contain her own mind. He will cancel his other appointments and let one client speak with him all day and the next day again and the next from nine to six. 
Part of the meaning and containment of psychoanalysis arise through the regular structure and limit of one's weekly hours. Bolas admits he has been criticized for his departure from the expected temporal frame. But he enacted this innovation because he sees such crisis moments as meaning-rich entrances into and through the unconscious, a potential for change that demands space and time and the engaged presence of another. He knows the alternate would be hospitalization and the numbing, sedating use of drugs that would prevent any psychic unfolding. In these extended sessions, he does not offer interpretation. He does not interject his analyses of what the client says. Instead, he listens in a state of reverie, letting the client's unconscious resonate with his own. When I first read of the expansiveness of this technique, after I had begun experiencing psychosis and before I met my friend L, I envied Bolas's patients who were allowed to experience their interior plenitude. My own experience of listening occurs hers only after the crisis, when I am able to translate it in scheduled hours to professional ears that I pay to listen. But when I have most needed to be heard, my psychic processes have been stopped by force. The suffering I tried to narrate in the hospital was refused a witness by the dimming of eyes, the turning away of a face, by an order to cuff my body to a bed within a closed box. I spoke to walls. I called to walls. What I experienced in and through psychiatric hospitals, human machinery, was not care, but a protracted and brutal form of unlistening. A high dose of antipsychotics left me still and quiet, asleep 14 hours a day, and the other hours blank, my slack face nothing but a toy with the batteries removed. 